The first interview I ever participated in was at Stockton College for a cable TV channel in New York. And I was the last in line of six to be interviewed. So I walked in and told the guy that I was very nervous about this interview because they put this camera right in my face, literally right here. So to break the ice, the guy turned the bright lights on and started saying, where were you in the night of the 24th? Where were you in the night of the 16th? <laughs> Does your wife know what the activities you've been involved in? <laughs> and the sweat just sort of pouring down my head. The interview was a disaster. I felt like I'd been swimming. <laughs> well, hopefully this won't be like that. Of all the talented people I went to school with at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, perhaps the smartest and most affable is a brilliant landscape painter named Chris Nissen. <laughs> This is called Panic Mode. I got a chance to film his recent show at the Gross McLeaf Gallery in Philadelphia and speak with him in his studio in Moorestown, New Jersey. I asked him how he ended up going to the Academy. You went to the University of Virginia, right? Right, I went to UVA and I graduated in 71, which is how many, 200 years now? I actually started out as an astronomy and physics major. After a year and a half of doing physics, I decided that I didn't want to do physics anymore. So I left school, graduated as an American government major, and had intended to work with the Foreign Service. But after we took the test, the government cut back all the new positions and funding for Foreign Service, so I came home and uh, ended up working for a computer marketing company. A catalog from the academy came across my desk. And I looked at it and thought, you know, I don't really like what I'm doing. I'd always painted as a hobby since I was a little kid. And I thought, you know, why didn't I ever decide to do that? So one thing led to another, and I ended up applying to the academy, taking my portfolio in a big trash bag. And with Dick Rank, I think, was, who was working at the academy that time, saw me walk in and said, this, now here's a guy who really values his work. He brought it in a black plastic trash bag. And that was my introduction to the Academy. <laughs> I know of no artist who takes his art more seriously and himself less seriously than Chris. He has always had this self-deprecating sense of humor, but is one of the most dedicated artists I have ever known. I asked him what he is trying to achieve in his art. I think generally what, I, what I'm trying to do is find a landscape that I identify with somehow that I'm connected to and it changes over the years what, what, what I connect with. But to try to portray that landscape and present it in, in a fashion that a person who sees the painting will have the same feeling towards that place that I do. I'm trying to capture the essence of a place, whether it's the way it sounds or it smells or there's something particular about it, I'm trying to portray that, but it's become more important to me over the last 10 years to use the paint as a medium just for the, its own appreciation. One of the things I remember Arthur da Costa used to always stress was the importance of having the paintings be atmospheric. And I remember him specifically loving your paintings because it had that quality. How do you achieve that? Everything in painting was difficult for me, but that, I think that's the one thing that came naturally for me. I like using a lot of wet paint, and I think by pushing wet paint together you kind of get soft edges. It makes a kind of transition from one value to another, from one color to another, from one intensity to another. Whereas using dry paint, the edges become a little more problematic, I think, to deal with. And this painting is painted really thinly. And you're right, the paint, the paint just got blended together and it makes a great atmosphere. Of course, there are lots of other things you do to create an atmosphere. The color, the use of perspective, size change. Every time you go back, you step down the size. The lines of the grid going to, going to the horizon. The values, the intensity, things that are very light in the foreground become grayer in the, in the background. All the tricks you use to kind of create distance. But it's funny you mention that because that atmosphere quality is something I've been fighting against now for 10 years. 
I love the way they look, but I try to fight against it because I'm trying to have an atmosphere, but at the same time have a flat quality to the paint. The fun of me for the, that I had in this painting particularly was painting the sky over the tree without really any attention to blending the edges and making them hard edged and flat. So I, I want the painting in some sense to say two things. I want it to portray the distance. I want you to get a sense of walking into the painting. But I also want to pay homage to the fact that it is a painting. It's on a flat surface. And I want to respect the flat, the flat surfacing by doing edges like this and just painting things with a hard edge and broadly brushed. It kind of puts it in between both worlds. This notion of two worlds seems to apply in two different senses. There is Chris's playful push and pull between atmospheric depth and the flatness of the picture plane. But there is also the two worlds of his subject matter. The urban industrial scenes are joined in counterpoint to his lovely pictures of Maine and their more bucolic space. Well, I think, first of all, having Sydney as a teacher really kind of turned me on to industrial areas in the city, and we started painting down at the oil refineries. There's a beauty down there that attracts me, it has to do with the abstract quality of the place. Big shapes, broad shapes, and there's usually some kind of grid of perspective. So they kind of set up for almost abstract equations. When I first started going to Maine, back when I got it, it's been 20 years or so, I looked at all the colors out there and decided, my God, there's a whole world of just all these colors, violets, fuchsias, reds, blues that I've never used, greens, quinacridone red I loved. And I thought, my God, if you're going to be a painter and you have access to all these colors, why not use them? So that, that's when I changed my palette, which has now been the same for about 20 years. I go through all the cadmium yellows, cadmium, all the cadmium colors, and then a couple quinacridone reds and thiocyanine reds, the traditional blues. And I use basically about 15 to 18 colors, every painting the same. And one thing that the Academy was very good in doing, I think, was with Tom Ewing who was kind of a little bit of a character and eccentric. He always made us take our palettes and play with them for an hour after we were done painting. Whatever paint was left on your palette, sit there and play with it until you learn how to mix color. And I think that was an invaluable lesson. And to this day, if I see a color, I know how to mix it instantaneously. At the beginning of this film, Chris recounted a video interrogation he received. Where were you in the night of the 24th? Where were you in the night of the 16th? Does your wife know of the activities you've been involved in? <laughs> I bet if you asked her, she'd have a pretty good idea of what he was up to on those two days. In all likelihood, Chris was painting. When you leave school, you're really so wrapped up in your painting, and then all of a sudden, you're confronted with this issue of, what am I gonna do? Am I gonna make a living? Am I gonna work for someone? How am I gonna do it? The pressure becomes, do you want to go to a big gallery in New York or San Francisco or the big city or do you want to stay where you're located and what makes you happiest? And I think it took me a long time to come to terms with that. that what made me happiest was really the painting. Doing the painting, going to my studio, spending time there, spending time out on location, mixing the paint, smelling the paint, all the things, the tactile senses that you get involved with. These things are remarkably hard to pry off of this pile. It's heavy enough to can barely lift it. So how many years is that? It's like half my lifetime. It's in hell holding half my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs>